should, uh, we should start in order to keep on time here. And uh, welcome back. Let's see. For those of you who have recovered from last night's festivities, <coughs> those of you who have not yet recovered, uh, welcome back to you also. Um, before we begin, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one of them, uh, I guess, to get a repetitive, but we will leave the offer up today and today only for you folks. So if you would like to be in the first 50 people who come to this reg site, you'll get $1,000 off of next year if you use the code, the fire code, which is Firebird2007. I know a number of you have already done that, so just so you know. Um, also, we have uh, another Roomba to give away, or Scuba to give away. And, uh, and so we need to have a show of hands here. Um, really easy question this morning, and it's, and it's kind of based on today's program. The question is, uh, who can give me a kind of a couple of sentence description of the mock effect? Did I see a hand? Standage, did I see your hand or not? Yeah, oh, he's, he's, it's up. All right, let's have it. That was an excellent description. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> this man has a scuba. All matter is interrelated and everything affects everything else. <laughs> well, we are very lucky to have with us today Gary Odell. Uh, you, those of you who are uh, serious fire starters will recall uh, Roger Brent being with us a couple of years ago, uh, who you, you're probably, for, and uh, Roger operates a center for excellence uh, in Berkeley or San Francisco, and, and Gary does exactly the same kind of thing up in my neck of the woods. And I first uh, met Gary, actually the, it was the first day that you'd come to the Friday Harbor Labs by accident, kind of, and, and uh, I heard about this guy who's going to be operating grids of hundreds of computers, and I thought, I have to meet this man. So uh, this is a thread that we've been working on now for a few years here at FIRE, which is the crossing over between the interesting powers of supercomputing or grid computing and what it can do for biology or genetics and all those things. So uh, it turns out that Gary is an expert at this, and we're going to talk today about a particular area in which he's working. If you remember, Roger was working on how to uh, model life mathematically in the yeast and some other things. Uh, we've had Lee Hartwell talking about some kind of related issues through the Fred Hutch Center, and now we're going to talk about how to do this in, in C. elegans and some other uh, beasts. And the, the basic idea is, in, in, this, in this particular moment, is, is how do you model mathematically what do you get from that? Uh, how useful is it? How do you do it with? What are the tools? And, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, Gary is the director of the Center for Cell Dynamics, which, as I mentioned, is one of these centers of excellence. I think there are, are there four of these? There, there are now seven. Seven. They just okay. announced two more. Great. So, and all of them are, are in some way other computer. Is that right? Are they all computer um, intensive? Many of them are. Uh, I think the one at, at Harvard is not so, so much computer intensive. Nor, nor at Princeton. Kind of a liberal arts school. Compared no, to it's that. just that they are doing more experiments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Stanford guy, so I had to. All right, and um, so I don't know exactly how you want to start this, Gary, but uh, I'll just tell you folks, I've, I've seen some of these things already, and uh, Gary has done an, an amazing amount of work with his team uh, in ways which I didn't think were possible to do. And so uh, I think some of the stuff we won't talk about uh, genetic networks, and I mean, right. no. yeah, no. but, but uh, it turns out there are levels, as we've discussed in SNS, there are levels of control, and then there are levels of meta levels of control, and how those things all work are so complex that you need mathematics and, and lots of computing power to, to bring them to heel and to understand them. 
So why don't, why don't you start by explaining what we're doing here, and I'll just pitch in when it seems necessary. <clears throat> so this is a meeting about the future. Let me say what my guess is about what this age will be remembered for. I think it'll be remembered chiefly for two things. One is the explosive uh, advances in, in computer science and computer hardware, and the other, uh, and not second to that, is going to be figuring out mechanistically how living things work, figuring out how the proteins that genes encode put themselves together in order to build organisms and operate them. Um, that's that's going to be the lasting uh, legacy of, of uh, this age. Um, so. What we're trying to do at this Center for Cell Dynamics is figure out how it is that um, a few simple case study processes work in, in organisms that develop rapidly and are easy to culture. So could you put on the video, please? There you go. There you go. Okay, so that is a stereo pair image of a C. elegans nematode worm. You're supposed to cross your eyes to fuse those images. Um, this is the poor man's um, version of what you saw the other <laughs> night. It costs uh, nothing. Very smart. Where are you when we need you? <laughs> um, so this is a C. elegans worm that Sidney Brenner convinced biologists to study as a study organism uh, in the 80s. Uh, its virtue is that it's made from only 1,000 cells, whereas you are made from about 10 to the 12th cells. Um, and it lays eggs every single day, and they're very inexpensive and simple to raise. They don't in elicit any empathy, so you can murder them to get their eggs and so on. And, um, and so what, w what we're trying to do is take apart this organism and reverse engineer some of its processes. I think of this as working out how crashed alien uh, spaceship technology might work. The advantage we have over the the one spaceship mothball to Area 57 is that, is that we can wreck a great number of them in trying to figure out how the technology works. So uh, th this is the egg that that organism lays in stereo. The orange is the actin in it, which is the molecule that runs your muscles, and the yellow are microtubules. Now today I'm going to talk mostly about microtubules. These are tiny, tiny tubes. Uh, nine million of them bundled together makes a, a, a tube the size of a human hair, and these tubes self-assemble uh, in, in a cell on the scale of about a minute and then fall apart on a, a little faster scale. Along these, um, along these uh, uh, microtubules, um, various motors run and carry things from here to there on the cell. So the, the point is that these are exceedingly small and they self-assemble from the proteins uh, tubulin that make them up. Now, uh, now they're so small that you need heroic You wanted me to ask you how do you see those microtubules? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. Just keep that's going. So, so th th this is one way that we see them. They're very small, much smaller than the wavelength of light. And so we take many hundreds of optical sections and stack them up like the like pieces of bread in a computer and make 3D reconstructions. And in that process, we have to account for how the, the light from a, from a point source, like this source here, spreads vertically along the microscope axis a couple of micrometers in each direction, uh, even if it's a confocal microscope. So that's one technique for seeing in fixed embryos. It's antibodies to tubulin that are recognizing these microtubules here. Here is another, I think, miraculous way that we see them. And this has some connection to Friday Harbor. So those whitish uh, tubes that you see, or lines, those are microtubules. The, this is a worm egg. Over here, the sperm enters and brings with it the, the male pronucleus, that's the dark sphere, and it brings two centrosomes that nucleate these microtubules, after which they grow out through the rest of the, of the cell. And the phenomenon I'm going to first talk about is how it is that the two nuclei fuse together, how they're drawn together, and how they then move to the center of the egg. Now, how do we see them? We steal the gene from a jellyfish that swarms in, around San Juan Island um, and splice that gene onto this tubulin gene in a worm so that every tubulin molecule is labeled with this uh, fluorophore that glows, a protein fluorophore, and we can see that in our microscopes in, in a live embryo. It's a technique that swept the world and, and biologists all over are using this to visualize any protein they want in, uh, in the cells that they want. 
So this, uh, this, uh, this process w that I just described goes on in a fixed embryo, killed fixed embryo, as does this one. This is another stereo pair reconstruction showing the microtubules in yellow, and the purple is the actin, which moves all to one end of the egg, the anterior end. Down here is a cartoon uh, uh, which depicts one of the motors, the single molecule motors, that runs along microtubules. There's tens of thousands of these in every cell, and they churn along microtubules, burning ATP as a fuel. They seem to be pretty sluggish in this movie, but they run at hundreds, uh, about 1,800 RPM uh, uh, to run along microtubules, and they carry cargoes. There are uh, different kinds of motors, one called kinesins, that run away from the centrosomes. The centrosomes are these sites where the microtubules are nucleated, and dynenes is another flavor of motor. They run in the opposite direction, and it's dynenes that I'm convinced is responsible for causing that pronuclear fusion and centration you saw in the last uh, slide. So Gary, let me just pause for a moment. <clears throat> uh, the importance of microtubules in life, right? I mean, this, I, I just want to underline this for a minute because we're watching cells divide. There are probably a number of various things that happen, uh, embryology, I mean, the, it, not just, so from the very beginning of life through many different cell functions. Microtubules are the physical things through that, that actually carry stuff around in the cell and achieve physical goals and partition the cell and create a geometry in the cell. And, and so in many different ways, there's kind of a navigational and a physical yep. setup that they provide. So it's extremely important. It's a gen generalized and important function in life. And it's common to virtually all uh, higher cells, right. all eukaryotic cells. It, it is, it's the scaffolding that takes apart chromosomes when cells divide. Um, it is uh, this universal uh, mechanism at the heart of cell biology. Right. Uh, and the tubulin that makes them is substitutable, f taken from a cow brain. You can put it into a fruit fly and it works just fine. Extremely it's conservative see, across all these species, it's which means it's very, very important. Very important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Keep going. Okay, so um, I, I need the, uh, yeah, the movie back. So th th there's an amazing uh, use that you can put the known sequence of this organism to. Uh, it, its entire genomic sequence is known. And that lets us um, make a poison pill food that will knock out any one or two or three genes that we want to. In other words, with a computer, we can get the sequence of the gene. Our molecular biologists can make a double-stranded RNA that we put in bacteria that the worms eat, and that double-stranded RNA gets into the eggs and defeats or ruins the, the targeted gene, any gene you want. So you can test genes so for you a can function. You can find out what happens when you knock out a gene. And what this, this uh, shows is, is the consequence of knocking out dynein. So here is the normal, the wild type, uh, entry of the sperm up here, the pronuclear fusion and centration, uh, the microtubules are white, and uh, as we go this way, more and more of the dynein has been knocked out by this uh, technique, and you can see that this process starts to occur later in time and more posteriorly, posterior is up, as you knock out more and more dynein until eventually uh, the, 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 it, the process completely fails for right. lack of dynein. You've lost your uh, geometry and you've lost your division. Yep. Yeah. Well, no, you still, ha you still oh. have microtubules, yeah. you still, but you don't have the motors, these particular okay. motors that run along them. So the kinesins are still working, but the dynein's aren't working because we've, we've ruined them all. So this experiment convinces us that it's dynein responsible mm -hmm. for this uh, event that I want to make a model of. Mm -hmm. So I realize I have not shown you a model yet, and this is about modeling. I am interleaving uh, experiments, pretty conventional experiments, with the modeling because the two urge each other on. It just makes no sense to make models of fantasies. Right. And, it, and in fact, uh, we are finding that we can't figure out ex what, what our experiments mean without the use of the models. Uh, so it's, it, 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 as it famously occurs in physics, models and experiments urge each other on and you can't do either without the other. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, 
So I'm now going to turn to a mathematical model. I need this slide back on. And I want to explain what kind of model this is. This is a model of the kind that Isaac Newton thought up. In, and I think this fellow had the second best idea in the whole world. He uh, proposed that the time rate of change of the state of any system, of planets, of whatever physical system you're talking about, the, the time rate of change of that state must be a function of the state of the system for lack of anything else to be a function of. I mean, what else could it be a function of? That statement in words becomes a differential equation which computers can solve if you can, you know, if you're brave enough to specify the state of the system that you care about and you can deduce the rules by which the current state influences the rate at which the state changes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a meeting largely about computers and I want to remark that it is the urgency to solve such equations that drove the, the invention of and the perfection of digital computers by the Defense Department. So here is a, a cartoon of this model. It's a movie frame. And, and what I'm doing here is I, I'm putting in hard sphere nuclei, centrosomes here, and hundreds or thousands of these yellow thready lines. Those are the microtubules. They're made of very many straight segments hinged together, at hinge points by springs. And they can grow and then they can shrink, stochastically switching between the two as real microtubules do. And in this model, there is a population of a few thousand dynein molecules, which drawn big would look like this. This sphere is supposed to be a motor head that could, once it hits a microtubule, run along it and pull on the tail, which could be connected either to the cortex of the cell or maybe to the, the nucleus. And that's the molecule that we knocked out in the experiments and caused this uh, process uh, to fail. So what I do is I write object-oriented code, which keeps track of tens or hundreds of thousands of parts with differential equations for each one and solve these numerically on a, we're using Linux cluster, dual processor, uh, dual core AMD machines. How many machines? What? How many machines? We have Probably. about 180 at the moment, mm -hmm. and we would have more, but we can't get the heat out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at the, you know, and we can't get any more electricity into the room, so that's what our limit is. Um, and it takes about, um, I guess, uh, eight hours or so to produce this kind of a simulation by solving all of those equations. This cartoon just shows what the differential equation solution says what happens. And what happens as a consequence of very simple interaction rules that I've mostly referred to is that the, the, the process reliably, time after time, uh, works. Okay, that, that when you start with the two centrosomes here, microtubules grow down. The motors that have accidentally bumped into the nuclei and stuck to them or accidentally bumped to the cortex and stuck there engage the microtubules. And the outcome, the emergent outcome, is to bring about this lifelike, apparently purposeful uh, behavior. Although I, having written the code, know there's no purpose in any of the, right. uh, you know, the, everything here is acting completely randomly. I forgot to say in that mathematical model, Everything here jumps around in Brownian motion rapidly. Uh, it's nothing like life on Earth. It's like life uh, in San Francisco would be if there were always a 9.5 Richter earthquake going on. Mm -hmm. Everything was jumping around all over the place, and cells have to work against that or harvest the thermal energy somehow. Uh, and that's what makes this math mathematical model work. Things randomly move around in order to collide, in order to interact, so that the consequences that emerge uh, can emerge. And I want to underline now something you, you just said, which is I think a lot of people think of modeling as though it's in play and you're just reproducing what you're seeing empirically. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that you're actually just putting parameters into an equation and, and that they, there is no destiny there, there is no intention to make the picture happen as much as there is to get the numbers right, to, to model right. those in terms of nature. And the result happens to be what you, what you see yes. in life. So it's an extremely important concept that, that if you have enough simple interacting proteins and, and they behave right to interact with each other, then when you put many together, this kind of thing is just going to emerge. Right. And the point of these models is not to make a Walt Disney cartoon that looks pretty. It's to figure out how the behavior changes as you change 
things about the, the, the setup, how many molecules there are and so on. And this remark here about this uh, happens robustly means that when I change the number of motors by a factor of 10 or 100, it still works. When I change, the, when I change anything here, it still works. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, this, this simulation shows what happens if, if I in the model knock out all the dynein or most of it. Well, uh, pretty much nothing happens, uh, although there's a feeble um, attempt at, at pronuclear fusion, something resembling what we see in the, in the experiments. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't have time, but I have a whole series of more and more knockdowns that look pretty much like the real thing. So, the, the, yeah, the, uh, let's underline it another time. What you see on the screen is what emerges from simple physics, from Newton's laws, and from nothing else. So, can you summarize this? Is this, uh, describe what we're all seeing uh, kind of in a well, final uh, way? Um, l l l let me skip that. This, I I'm delighted actually to have put together this simulation, which is so complicated I couldn't figure out how it's doing what it does. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie gives a hint about how it's doing what it does. It's the movie you've already seen, but in a moment I'm going to show it again in optical section with all of the dynings drawn. And then what you see is a bald spot at the top here. What's happened is that the dynings on the way to diffusing there to stick there got intercepted by microtubules. They didn't get there. Mm -hmm. And this bald spot, which is going to show up for a couple of reasons that I don't have time to explain, will, um, will be on the side closest to the centrosomes. And for that reason, microtubules that grow out this way are more likely to engage a motor and get pulled in the opposite direction. Which creates so, a differential yeah. force. Yeah. 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 So, so this I did not foresee whatsoever. This took me completely <laughs> by surprise. And I was uh, delighted that Pinocchio started to twitch and, mm -hmm. you know, behaved in, a, in an interesting way. There were way behaviors that, that were emerging that you hadn't That, that I had not, yeah. I had not. Uh, Programmed. Yeah. 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 So, um, let, let, let me say another thing to underline the robustness. Here I'm starting off the centrosomes in the wrong place, completely the wrong place. And nevertheless, um, the end point is the same. And these blue, these small blue things are? Oh, those are representing yolk particles. This egg is full of yolk particles. <coughs> and after the initial success, I'm starting to put in representations of all the other stuff in the cell that actually gets in the way of this motion right. to see if this mechanism see, can, still works can work in the face of all these yolk uh, obstacles. Mm -hmm. So th this is an illustration of how robustly this mechanism is. There is no plan of what's supposed to happen in this kind of a model. Whatever happens, uh, happens. And here what you can see is that it takes a different route to get to the same endpoint, same namely, point. namely with a nuclei in the middle. Right. And when you, when you end up with the parameters that you've selected and you finally are happy with those, that's in some sense truth in life. I and mean, that's telling you some, the value of those parameters is extremely important and interesting and meaningful. Well, Mark, I, I, I'm an engineer, and I expected that when I started <laughs> this, uh, that by, the, by parameter optimization, we could find the values of the parameters that hadn't been measured by biologists. And that turns out not to be achievable because these things are just so robust. Yeah. Um, that is to say, I can change the parameters very widely, factors of 10 or 100, and it still works. And that means it's not possible to identify the values of these parameters ah. by this reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. The only way to get those is from experiment. That was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but that has turned out to be true of every mechanism that we have studied. So the way the models break is not by parameter variation, but by having the wrong math. Or, or, or break structurally, like if, if we put in uh, simulating the effect of a drug acting on this, mm -hmm. uh, it wrecks it. Yeah. Because it, it abolishes the microtubules. Right. So are you at the point where you feel like you've uh, fully described this behavior? I, th I think this is right. Uh, the worm research community doesn't yet think it's right. <laughs> so I have to do some more describing. Catch up. <laughs> yeah. But, but as far as you're, you're concerned, you kind of feel like this modeling has helped you understand how this works? Oh, yeah, because I, I chose this phenomenon because I cannot understand how 
motors at the cortex, at the edge, pulling on microtubules, would, would push the nuclei to the middle rather than pull them, pull, pull them to the edge. Mm -hmm. So it was entirely counterintuitive to me that pulling motors could do what, what you see. Yeah. I'm extremely pleased that it's come out this way, and I think this model has uh, application to lots and lots of other uh, uh, phenomena. Such as? Well, so the, the, the thing that we're most interested in actually here, I need some more video on the screen. This is a sand dollar egg, a distant relative of ours dividing. You can see the, sh the ghosts of microtubules at work. Uh, this is without any fluorescent tags, and this cell is about to divide. Uh, this was uh, the, the, the muscle, the transient muscle called the contractile ring that pinches two cells in half is something that Tom Schroeder discovered at Friday Harbor Lab. Yes. It must be a biological hotspot. I used to know uh, Tom Schroeder. Okay. And, um, and believe it or not, scientists still don't know how it is that the microtubule structures cause this contractile ring to be located it, right in the right place to pinch the cell in half and put two nuclei at each end. And um, we are trying to figure that uh, puzzle out. Uh, here is some uh, video that George Von Dasso and Bill Bennett made where they used a GFP tagged probe that recognizes a, a kinase that turns on myosin that engages with actin and, and constricts the cell. And, and this white light up is, is where this machinery is activated uh, at the equator uh, prior to cutting cells in half. This is a fundamental process of life. Uh, I, I forgot to say earlier on that most anti-cancer agents, uh, chemotherapy agents, are directed to ruin microtubules yeah. and, and kill cells. Taxol, for example, stabilizes them. Uh -huh. um, this is a, uh, let's not uh, do this picture, but we're trying to understand how it is that uh, these microtubules locate this contractile ring. And uh, my wife, Victoria Fo, recently made a, uh, a really important discovery that has that bears on this. Uh, you will be the first audience to hear about it. Um, <laughs> so here's here. Th what she found is that, um, what, so here are chromosomes on microtubules as a cell prepares to divide. Um, what she found is that, whereas this is what the normal microtubules in a dividing uh, urchin cell looks like, if she hits it with a powerful microtubule disrupting drug, it destroys most of the microtubules except a few. There are microtubules in here that are stable against the most ferocious drug that d disrupts them. And as you go toward the moment of division, more and more of these stabilized microtubules grow out and contact the cortex right where the myosin, the blue probe here, lights up to make this contractile ring. Interesting. This is an unsuspected. It's a special family of It's a special family. We don't know what stabilizes them, but if we, but, but we're pretty sure that it, it is these stable microtubules that position the, the machinery. Uh -huh. right. And then we, 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 so what we wanted to, do, so, so here's some more 3D reconstructions of that myosin in the microtubules in a fixed uh, urchin embryo. And you can see these little patches of myosin light up apparently where those stable microtubules make it out to the cortex. Right. And, and we have been trying to puzzle out how, what are the microtubules doing to activate the myosin out there. And that's where we needed a mathematical model. Now, here's the, here's the idea. You have kinesins running along microtubules away from the centrosomes, out to the edge. If a microtubule is continuously advancing and retracting, advancing and retracting, the kinesins running along it will never get out to the cortex. But if you have a microtubule that just sits there stably, the kinesins can make the whole trip mm -hmm. and concentrate where the microtubules that so reach the cortex. So this special family of, right? Yes. So we think the special family is what locates the contractile ring. Here is a computer simulation. And it provides a pathway. It, it provides a roads that lead to the equator. Kinesins carry this rho gap, that the so, rho gap that turns on the thing that turns on the myosin. So, so those things provide, the special family provides both the navigation or the geometry and the highway for the actual event to occur. Yes, so the kinesins don't know any, they just run down whatever microtubule they're on, but if, so here are the white dots are the kinesins, and they're sticking to the microtubules and starting to run out to the ends of them. And in a moment in this simulation, I'll simulate uh, what happens when we apply nicotazole. It destroys the microtubules that are unstable, leaving the ones that are stable. And that leads to brightening up 
the white spots, which are what's turning uh -huh. on the myosin, uh, as we see in experiments. Yep. So we're, I mean, it sort of that illustrates how we're going back and forth between experiments and, yep. and using these models to figure out how on earth would these stable microtubules make any difference. Wow, that's absolutely beautiful. And we're out of time. Thank you very much.